Hello. So, my name is Rainer Kuhn. Um, I'm a software developer at SNC since 1999. Um, but, to be honest, since 2004 or so, I'm giving a lot of Python tutorials, I'm giving a lot of tutorials. <coughs> um, our product is the minus I'm on for the whole uh, tutorial stuff. And I'm coordinating uh, internally um, first education group. And as you can imagine, that's a uh, side effect of this group. Uh, so I will give you an overview of Hitler's past level. And um, to be honest, it, cannot, it can only be an overview because I have to uh, cover 1300 pages. That's too long to do it in here. So that was all about me. Now the more interesting man, I think you know, he was told that's the event of C++. And uh, I got him, here's this uh, one on the side of from him. <laughs> Surprisingly, it teaches this piece like a new language, but pieces just fit together better. And that's the sentence I want to prove. So, a little bit of an overview. I will talk a little bit about the past, a lot about the present, <coughs> concerning what's new in the core language, concerning what's new in the multi threading and also the standard library. And a little bit about the future, and you will see. So let's start. To get the idea of C++ in you have to have the uh, idea of the timeline of C++. So you can imagine what happened last year. Uh, you see here a, a few uh, big red arrows and a few uh, smaller ones in black. And these big ones are the actual standards. C98, 13 years later, C11. And that uh, strange guy should be the new standard, C++ 1. One five. So, a few words about the uh, black <coughs> 1989, the so called annotated reference, C++ reference man manual was published by John Bostock, and the reason was relatively simple. There were a lot of um, C++ dialects available, so you have to write a kind of a, a reference. This was also the first step to C++ engineering. In C++ 03, a so-called bug fix release was released, that's not so important for you, but what's <coughs> more important is the technical report one, and that one was published 2005, and uh, it consists of 14, I think 14 libraries, and 13 of them are actually in the, uh, in the actual standard, the C++ standard. And now, that's about the future, which will come later. So, my first, uh, my last slide, talking about the principles. Um, to have an idea of C++11, to have an idea of C++, and the uh, idea is, uh, one principle of C++, of course, is trust the programmer. So, that will also stand for C++11. You, because you have a very powerful uh, tool in your uh, hand, which you can use to uh, solve the problems. <coughs> then, what's also critical for C++, you don't have to pay for something you don't need. Maybe we talked about reflection as runtime, we talked about exception handling, we talked about... I think you know it's shared for handling. You have only to pay for such things, and you actually need it. Then, downgrade existing code. That means, Code that runs, uh, old code should run with a new compiler. That's relatively simple to get. And then, of course, C++ is a strategy type language, <laughs> so you should prefer compile time errors over run time errors. Compared with Python, it can happen, it often will happen, that the error will occur at the customer side. That's not so good. As a side note, I like Python, but only to mention. Then the is for C++ 11, it should be a better programming language for system programming. As we heard it before, you can things do like uh, addressing the memory model, you can things do like uh, defining the layout of your data, so you have an extremely powerful tool system. And what's more important, should be a better, uh, should be a better programming language for building of libraries. Of course, you have new semantics, 
you have perfect form of them, you have Maya right, templates, and a lot of additional stuff. I will mention it next slide. And that is the point I should I think we should also mention. It should be easier to teach and to learn. To be honest, I will not uh, <laughs> in case my children want to learn programming language, I say will say to to them T shirt use whatever here, T shirt use Python. T shirt and use simple stuff. It's too it's too complicated for your child, to be honest. So it should be easier to teach and to learn. I will um, um, make one sentence. It should follow the principle of last surprise. That means you have a, a key point. You understand this key point, and it will uh, it will hold on this part of C++ and it should also hold on a different part of C++. You get the idea of C++. And that is uh, if a programming language follows this principle of last surprise, it's nice and different programming language. Of course, time will do it. So, red is my color. You see, all what's right on the on the slides, <coughs> not all, I'm not totally sure, but it should be. These are the new features, and not blue, blue one are the old ones. So, also, maybe some of you know it from Pascal, automatic type production, <coughs> where you get to get a type for free, and it's relatively straightforward. You have an initializer, you say auto, now you get a string, my string. You get an int, you get an double. In this case, it's not a big deal. But, have a look here. In case you uh, want to define iterator to the begin of a container, you have to write it in an extremely long way, but now you can always only say auto. That will make the same. And here, a new the next example, and have a look here. This little function will only take two int arguments, edit, and return an int. That's similar. But I want to define a function pointer to that function. So I want to do it with um, classical C++. Here I define a function pointer called like at one. It will take one, two ints, and will return one int. And here I initialize it <coughs> with, a, with this int function from above. <coughs> That you can do, or you can do also that in a different way. I think it's your choice. And here you see the application of these both functions. They are equal. But what you will give it you for free. There exists a lot of uh, capability in C++ for um, order of using a type. It's called decade type. It's a little bit more robust. It's a little bit different. But there is one uh, additional use case that I will show in the next slide. Here you see it, we have a decade type, and you declare my string as the de declared type of the string str. That's the syntax. You see it in the robot. I can also use it for defining a function pointer, <laughs> and it will behave the same way. To be honest, that's no reason for a decade type, but you will see it now. You can do this decade type some uh, a different use case. Okay. Um, in C++ 11, there exists a so-called alternative function syntax. And um, this syntax is, in most cases, is optional. In few cases, required. Here's, here's this is required. Have a look here. Here I'm defining a function called func, taking arguments, returning in the return value as type, and here is the function body. That's the syntax of this new um, alternative function syntax. Then, what I want to solve is to write a generic function which will return the return type of that, fun of that function automatically. And that's what you can do with any type. Have a look here. Here I apply the function as <coughs> I have two integers and I will get as the return value an int because in case you add two integers, so the starting type should be an int. If I use this function template for myself with an int and a double, I will, I will get a double. If I use it with a long long int, which is the new type, with uh, an int, I will get a for long long int. And that one you will get for free. Have a look here. Here, I define a function template 
taking two, two arguments of different kinds, first and second, and I will begin from the from, from the beginning. I will start with <coughs> the beginning. Here, normally, it's not a term type will follow, but in this case, you see, I only say auto. That means, hey, wait a second, it will come later. I say auto, then here I define the return type. And you see, the return type is a type which I will get from the compiler by adding first and second. So it will automatically be introduced. And that is a great tool for library writers, for writing totally general uh, <coughs> libraries. Um, uh, why is it not automatically used from the return statement? I mean, why do you have to explicitly declare it? Um, what, what, what do you say? It kind of seems redundant if you write the same expression. Um, that's only uh, so the case in uh, that place. You don't know actually what's happening here, so you have to specify it at the end. And to introduce it, you have to uh, use the auto mm -hmm. keyword. In this case, it's a different auto. What's the one I told yeah, you that's before? That's true, but can the compiler automatically introduce the return? I think he wants to answer it. Yeah. Uh, in this particular case, you're right. Uh, but it's a trivial case, so you could have you could have multiple return statements. So what should the compiler do? Just for one example. So in complex compiler functions, it's not always possible to be right in the type if you don't specify it. Okay. Um, okay. As you mentioned, it's a trivial case, but uh, I have to uh, have it. Uh, to uh, I must run it for one time. It's the first one. Okay. And, yeah. And um, only to um, say to you. This code should work. Uh, all code you will see in the next uh, nine minutes works actually. So, now I think <coughs> one of my favorite uh, new feature in C++ Lambda, Lambda functions. You have you have heard it from Mike. You will hear it also tomorrow from Jesse, I think, or? And Lambda functions. What are Lambda functions? Lambda functions are, of course, known from the functional uh, programming languages. These are functions with our names, define a functionality right in place, and that's the key point, can be copied by data. That means a Lambda function is a so-called first-class function. That means you can copy it, uh, you can give it as an argument to a function, and also a choice for a function. It's like data. One uh, remarks. For me, one subject, uh, 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 lambda function should be concise. I think it makes no sense to write a big lambda function and use it. It should be concise. And it should also be what uh, I think to that, less extended. That means, in case you write a long comment to extend your lambda function, you make something important, I guess. That's only <coughs> idea. I, I used it in Python, I used it in test so I think so it should be small expression. So, one additional remark that I will show you, uh, one additional slide, and I'll show you an example. Here, a lambda function, that is the structure of a lambda function consisting of four parts. These two ones are optional, and at first, you have to introduce it by using a square bracket, and here you can capture the uh, uh, defining scope by by uh, reference or by copy, and so it's also called a closure because it uh, copies the environment. Then optional arguments and optionally return value in this new function style, uh, function syntax. And then what, what should follow, of course, is the function body. But this one are optional and Two simple lambda functions, uh, two more. This is old C++ 98 stuff. Here I'm initializing a vector, that of course is new, by uh, saying I have a vector of the uh, element two, uh, three, two, one, four, four five, uh, five, four, sorry. And um, what I want to achieve is to solve them in decreasing order. With classical C++, you will do it in such a way you use the standard template library algorithm sort and say, go from the next begin, this direct end, and apply my sorting criterion, my sort, which is under the hood 
a so-called function object or function operator. The key point is the call operator is overloaded and here is specifying the sorting criteria and this one is found should be bigger than W. That's good. What's bad about this time? You have to define one class only to use it once. That's a little bit annoying. What's also bad is this class maybe was defined in a totally different place of your source code and here you use it to get an idea what's, what's actually going to be done. You have to read the source code. That makes no sense. And what's also uh, not good, the code is not local. That means I, uh, the compiler has less opportunity to optimize. So many reasons to do it in a modern way. You can of course here also use a function, but that's your choice. But, you know, I will talk about C++ so I will talk about lambda functions. I do the same in two ways, and I lay it uh, with only a different layer. That's all. Here, I will, I will begin with the first one, sort, back begin, and so right end, something like the above, and here I will specify my lambda function. And that's all. That will do it in place. And that was it. You can lay, it, lay out it in such a way, then it looks like a function, because it's only a function without name. Uh, we call it also anonymous function. There are many, many different expressions available for this type of uh, expression. Or you can do it as I prefer to it in one line. That's the same. And in case you can write it in one name, you know it's concise. Uh, in one line, sorry. <laughs> you know it's concise. But uh, I think. Uh, the text is still uh, promising. Only a few uh, other examples. Here, uh, the, the new threat facility, uh, capability of C11. And what our threat wants to, wants to have is something he wanted to work, he wanted to do. And that package I uh, define by using a lambda function. You see it here? Square bracket, and this threat will only display this ID. And here, I don't know what very expensive function is, but it should be very expensive. So only two uh, applications of lambda functions. In this case, in a use case of uh, starting a thread or using a thread. And you know, from before, I talked about first class functions. Functions are first, uh, yeah, of course, lambda functions are first class functions. So you can use them as argument of functions, or your return can return them as return value from functions. Those use cases that I will show you. Here, I write a lambda function. Extremely simple one. This one will only return a um, string uh, saying lambda function. Only extremely simple. Here, I define it. Now that the function, that function has actually a name, my lambda, and I can pass it to this function, which wants to have something like a Call it a unit, maybe a function, maybe a function uh, object, maybe a lambda function. So, and now have a look here. I made a, I build a function which returns a lambda function. So it's called lambda. lambda. This lambda function is extremely simple. It only returns the string 2011. And what you see here is a new uh, function template. And this function template um, describes the return value of this lambda function. And if you look carefully, you see this uh, lambda function I return will return, will get no argument because this lambda function has no argument. And it will return a string which corresponds to this string. So that's the syntax for uh, defining function record in an extremely uh, convenient way. That's new is C++ I will talk about this stuff also in my last slide, so you have to wait for, I don't see it, maybe 14, 50 slides. No, still in unified implementation. I think that's great, because there are a lot of uh, exceptions and a lot of rules you have to remember to initialize data in C++ 98. I think about 6 or 8. But in C++ it's so easy. The only one you have to remember is who's curling braces. <coughs> have a look here. 
in and this is selected by this one. That's trivial, I know it. But here that's a little bit more uh, interesting. I'm initializing the vector in a syntax like an aggregate. That means I initialize the vector and I give it the three values. I have not to say push back three times. I can do it directly. And I can also do it with an unordered map. An unordered map, I think you know it, is similar to the map you know, uh, which you know from C98. It's a kind of a, a set of pairs where the first one is the key and the second one is the value. So I know I have to I have to give pairs and have a look. This is a pair and this is a pair and I have the curly braces around the pair. I can do it. I can also apply it in constructor in, in the constructor analyzer. That will work. That was not possible before. And I can also do it on a constant array. That works. So the rule is extremely straightforward with curly braces. <laughs> so, an additional feature which I think will address the C++ minimum. Range-based polymer. Well, you can relatively comfortably iterate over a container. You can output it, you can do something with it, or you can um, modify the elements in the container. Have a look here. That's my container, and I want only to output the values. Here I said auto because I want to have the type, and that was it. That works for all range-based um, data structures, like containers. I can do it also by the unordered map. Here you see it. In this case, I get no element, I get a pair, so I have to address the first one, which is the key, and I have to address the second one, which is the value. And here I give it out. I think you have, you have not to fight here about this uh, stood vector int uh, column column const underscore iterator double uh, equal <laughs> p begin semicolon. You can do it in a such a way. Uh, you can do it in a way, but it's, that's your choice. So, what you can also do is you can uh, take the argument by reference. See it here? Without, with reference. And the key point is, taking something by reference, you can modify it. So here, I think uh, I um, multiply each element by 2, and then I get the vector 2, 3, 4, 6, 8, 10. And that was one and simple. Because I have it as a reference in my uh, under control, so I can modify it. I can do, of course, the same with an string, only for testing. I, I take it by reference. I say, give me the uh, capital level, and I give it out. In this case, I have to use the reference. Giving it out makes no sense. I can also do it with the reference, but in this case, it's, uh, it's uh, copying it. It's, uh, it's all the possible. <coughs> okay. Okay, <coughs> that's fine. It's, uh, is it copied from each string? Of course. If I'm not specifying a uh, 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 reference, it's copying. So it's harmful. So you should you recommend then const reference there? Sorry, I don't get you. Should you then recommend const reference there? Also const reference C? Or is it uh, more? Mm. Okay. Maybe uh, here you have to specify uh, reference. Of course, you want to modify it. Yes. I don't want to copy string. Yes, you can do it in a different way. Const out struct. You can do it also so. Yeah, that was my question. Yes, you can do it, but to be honest, I, I was too lazy to do it. Well, I'll say more. It depends. You know, the best answer is always to say it depends. Yes, it's only a small piece of data. <laughs> Yeah, maybe you are right. <laughs> Good, um, that's now a, a, a few features concerning creating classes and using them, of course. <laughs> and C11 has constructed dedication variables. What does it what mean? I have here a constructor which is relatively intelligent. 
he gets the mint and he checks if the int value is in the right range. If not, he sets the he sets the value to zero. Only to make an example. And this one, have a look here, by our the, the first constructor, what is the hook use does one which uh, we take an int. And also here's this one, we'll get a double and we will have to the input. In some days you have to write a init function or something like that and you have to invoke it from each constructor. So in this case you can one destructor can work in our constructor. So inheritance. I think that's the only maybe it's the only feature which will not work with GCC for some I'm not too sure. But one of them. Um, what you can do is you can inherit constructors. I have a look here, I have a base class having two constructors, taking an int, taking a string. And this one, well, he has one uh, uh, taking a double. And um, what I can do is now I can say derive 20 them, and this one will use that one because it was, uh, it was derived. But I can also use the derived one. The key point is. That's a, uh, that's a decision about getting all or nothing from the base. You get all from the base or nothing from the base. So you cannot uh, say, I only want to have specific. In that case, you have to override it in the derived class. So, oh, we talked in the last talk a little bit about default, and that's great. Because, um, you know, the more explicit your code is, the better it is. Uh, you have not to use tricks, you can use the language to express your uh, uh, intention. And you can do it with default and with next step with the mean. So these are kind of um, declarative programming, if you will. Have a look here. You know, in case you uh, define a simple class, you get up to 15 different methods, operators, and so on for free. Have a look here. Default, copy constructor, assignment operator, operator new, destructor, uh, special access operators, uh, operator new, operator delete, I have a lot of stuff. And what's the idea? Uh, you know, you can by default say, in case the compiler will not auto generate for you this kind of uh, method or operations. You can say, I want to have your implementation. I only say, I only uh, say, I want to have it, and the compiler will do it for you. So in this case, look here, I uh, define the constructor taking the int, and that's the reason for normally having no default constructor. But here I say default. So the compiler will give me his implementation of the default constructor. Maybe it's uh, it's a uh, extremely fast one. That's the idea. And what's, what's special about these two cases here is you get the, the default, the auto-generated default copy constructor and so on and so on. And this one will be not virtual, will be public, and maybe the arguments are have to be constantly dependent on the operator. So uh, sometimes you want to have a destructor which is virtual. In such case, you have to do it in a different way. You have to declare it in the, in the class and you have to define it afterwards. So you can uh, get a virtual destructor because the default one is not virtual. That's the key point. Also here, you see what I have missed here? The const, const reference. Operator, uh, assigned operator should take the argument by const reference. And this one is only uh, reference, so I have to define it outside. That one you have to remember. I don't remember it the first time, I was a little bit irritated. Now, the different default, of course, is unique, and you have a look here. I'm defining a class only declarative. I think that's great. I say, I want to have the default constructor default, and I want to say my class should not be copyable. Then I say, uh, default assignment operator should be deleted, should be deleted. And uh, the copy, uh, the, uh, <coughs> copy constructor should also, I said it also be unique. That means I suppress the function notation. And this graph cannot be copied. 
And you have to uh, think about who's semantical something like that, but this class cannot be common. And I mentioned it once more, extremely exclusive, and that's great. But you can do also funny uh, things with, with fields. Here I want to have a function, only double, which accepts only double arguments. No int, no float, no pool or whatsoever, only double. How can I achieve that? I have to uh, define a function only double, and I de define also a function template with the same name, which I set to delete. What will happen now? In a case I work only double three, this one will be used and this one is set to delete, so I get this expression, which I can study in English in the wrong way, but that's not the point. Um, in case I work only double of three or three with double, uh, this uh, function will be used and this is, is of course okay. So you can use them to delete also in different ways to suppress uh, uh, promotions or uh, converts or something like that. So, oh, that's nice, other two, two team guys here. <laughs> yeah. I think you will support a right? Oh yes. Because it's terrible. In my former days, as a software developer, maybe in the last century, uh, yeah, last millennium, um, I wrote two T3, a lot of, and you know what's uh, happened, what what's happens on them? You overwrite a method in the fifth level of your uh, widget hierarchy, and you miss the damn C, or you missed the, uh, you used the wrong signature. Uh, and what's actually happening is your code is of course right, but it will behave maybe in a strange way. And what's the point about that is you can say you can express by overwrite that you want to overwrite with some one. A, a method of a, of a base class. If not, the compiler will tell you. <coughs> have a look here, I forget, forget the theme. Have a look here, I forget, I uh, missed double and float. What, 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 here I forget the const. Here, uh, long and int was mixed up. And here, I, I did it right. <laughs> you know it, you know the, uh, I know the convention. You wrote uh, override methods only writing print something as a method only to show that it won't be a word. I said it's terrible. Oh, kind of. Okay. By kind of, you can do something like it should not be able to uh, override this method. Have a look here. This method will take it in. Yeah, I'm deriving from it, and here I will get an error because it's not, a, it's not allowed to override kind of. You can do it on methods, you can also do it on uh, classes, and you know, you have not to use any dirty tricks like writing on private descriptor as that's true. You can do it explicitly, and that's done. Oh no, so more advanced stuff. I will go a little bit. I think you heard it before from that, I will tell you once more because I think. You have to hear it many times to get it. Um, <laughs> other references are special references that can divide to our value. Good. Good. The key point is now, what's our value? I only described it in this. That's a kind of a, something temporary. That's a kind of an object without, without a name. That's a kind of object on which you cannot determine the address. That's uh, you can use it. Here I use the array reference. Here that's the L value because that one has a, of it has a name. You can change the address of it. That's the L value. Then I can bind to this L value reference the L value. That's okay. In case I want to bind uh, to an L value reference with these uh, two L symbols, I have to use an algorithm. And you see what it is? That's the in place invocation of a constructor, which is of course temporary, so it's an algorithm. And uh, the magic, what will happen is that the compiler will do it for you. He will then find 
L values to L value references, uh, different directions, and L value references to L values. That's the key idea. And the key observation is in case you have something which is temporary, uh, of course, you have not to care about because it's temporary. So you can uh, make special things with this temporary because after the expression, it's not it's no more available. So of course you can steal the content of the temporary. And that's the key idea <coughs> to remember. Something temporary doesn't matter. You can destroy it. And two uh, uh, typical use cases are move semantic and topic forwarding. I will try <coughs> I give you a picture of uh, the idea of move semantic only to show you the difference. Um, here I have the string ABC <coughs> to the F. I want to show you what, what copy semantics means under hood. I have a string str2 and I copy string 1 to string 2. Afterwards, those things will have the same value because it was copied. That's copy semantics. And you can look here. I use the same string, string 1, abcdf, string str3, and now I'm moving str1 to str3. What will be done under the hood is that after this expression, string 1 is empty because I move the content from uh, string 1 to string 3. And here you see it, string 1 is empty. String 3 gets the content of um, string 1. Here, under the root, um, uh, is I will say that it's different. Um, standard move will explicitly move the content of the cross. Um, just to be a nitpicky, uh, is that the string, string one? Thank you. Is string one in fact defined to be empty or is it undefined? String one? After oh, so the move. That, uh, uh, you should have implemented in such a way that uh, it consists of three steps. At first, uh, if you uh, copy string one to string three, maybe, a uh, move, sorry, how about copy, moving, string one to string three, you should, in the copy constructor, at first um, delete the content of string 3, assign it string 1 to string 3, and afterwards um, empty string 1. This, this uh, three steps we have to uh, implement. That's the right semantics of doing it. Yeah, from the standard of say that movable types uh, must be uh, in the default initialized state after the move. So that requires the question. By the way, all the strings are small object optimized, so this would yeah, actually move the, the characters and You know what will happen if I use a longer one here. Then it would be. Yes, but I have no days. <laughs> so, um, I think I have, how, how many times do you have? I can make a break because I have seven, seven minutes. minutes. Yeah, well, I will continue. Then you will break it and I'll make it. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> Not for a green break my I get it. Yeah. Here only a simple example. In case you have an IP vector consisting of int, and you know that's the uh, benefit of it. That's one benefit of move semantics. You know you need IP vector no more. You can only move the content from my vector to my vector two and what will and that's good take place is only um, the point of the data will be adjusted. So you can imagine that's a lot cheaper than copy a line by magic vector to uh, magic vector to magic vector to. <coughs> and a nice great benefit of copies and move semantic is also this one. There are a lot of types which are not copyable, but you can move them. And by move semantic, you can um, make different use cases. Have a look here. Um, copies, uh, objects which, should, which cannot be copied are the new shared one, the unique pointer, making files, new text, promise, future, makes no sense to copy a new text because the new text has to, uh, to uh, protect a critical region. So you cannot copy it. Oh, okay, well, of course. So in that case, you can, of course, move the new text. Have a look here. I have a new text here. I will explain it later how it will work. Then you uh, use the new text to initialize the constructor here in the log. 
but afterwards you can move the whole text from this block to this block. But you can only move it. Of course, it makes no sense to move a new text because only one should only access the virtual region. It has a global variability to, to protect or something like that. So, by move semantics, you can move objects which are not copyable. And that's great. Perfect policy. That is a little bit hard. And that <coughs> this, this is the kind of slides this bus is known for. Um, um, you can write totally generic functions which can forward the arguments preserving the L and L value uh, items of that argument. In format text, you have not in, 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 it was not possible, you can see it here, so uh, code for the user. <coughs> and last in use case are factory functions or constructors. A factory function gets an argument, give it to the function and do something with that and produce something. So the <coughs> Uh, L value, L value item should be preserved. Constructor the same. Constructor gets the arguments. Maybe mm -hmm. use internally an, an after constructor or something like that. So you should preserve also the uh, L value, L value, L value items. Here I show you an example. Uh, I make it extremely simple um, uh, function template which will create a uh, initialize this file. I can invoke it with an R value, you know, file is an R value, no address, no name, and I will get a file. And here I use an L value because this one has a name, has an address, and all to my form, and I can use it also. In format test, I have to write this function in two ways. I have to accept the value by um, const L value reference and by L value reference. And depending on that, one or the other function will be used. In this case, I have to do it. The key point is also, yeah, if you have a function taking three arguments in the format test, you have to write it in <coughs> two, uh, two times two times two, eight different uh, variations. And now to the most annoying slide in my presentation. This is about working templates. I will make this a uh, function uh, uh, function template a little, more, a little bit more uh, general. Biotic templates are templates which can take an arbitrary number of arguments. Uh, by so three dots, you uh, define a so-called parameter pack, and what you can do with a parameter pack is two things, pack or unpack it. That's all. But have a look here. Uh, before I continue, <coughs> typically the applications of uh, writer's template are standard tuple, which is a new heterogeneous container, and uh, they use under the hood via the template for accepting uh, arbitrary number of arguments. And of course, a lot of the new uh, constructors are writer templates, so standard threads can take a wide uh, arbitrary number of arguments. So, have a look here. You know it from before? I will make a function template which accepts an arbitrary number of arguments and will produce me a new uh, object. Create object. <laughs> my object should be of type string and now that's my first name, right now. Now I have a new object. Then I create a uh, arbitrary type, my struct, accepting three arguments in double and string. I invoke it to an object of type my struct, given with three uh, arguments, and you do it work. Totally generic. Under the hood, this one is a temporary, so it will be forwarded to this guy here. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> that was too much. <laughs> that was a good recapitulation. <laughs> do you have it? Oh, oh it's five seconds to make up three. One, once more. My struct, that's the type my struct, getting two arguments. And here, I say create an object, 
This is also three, three arguments. You see, I do take it by outlining your reference. This, this will be expanded. Can you want to do two things? In this case, the primary tax will be expanded. And here, I forward it to the constructor of T. And T is, in this case, this way. Maybe in string here. Yeah. Maybe a uh, nice box here. Totally generic. Also preserving the L value and R value uh, IT story of the, of, of the constructor invocation. Uh, sorry, of the function invocation. Now I should think we should make a break. And it gives you a try to, uh, of course, to question that. Sorry. Yeah, do it. <laughs> uh, I, I heard a lot about uh, today, I mean, uh, about uh, how we should be reported errors uh, during compile time and about correctness uh, of the code, etc. But this uh, melody, so to say, uh, order, I, I suppose, will be very popular at programmers. Uh, does that, uh, do you think that, that contrasts uh, the slogan? Sorry, I don't understand the middle part of your question. No. Uh, I want to say that uh, using of the order of the keyword uh, contrasts uh, the slogan uh, I heard many times today. Uh, we should uh, be reported errors uh, during compile time. Uh, we should uh, have compile time corrections, etc. I think the order will be very popular. I don't see the point with auto. I don't get it. But the point is um, there's extra discussion about using auto because many people think they should uh, write the type manually. Because it's more, uh, uh, it's more personal, it's more obvious. But to say it in a different way, you know, writing templates, such like long templates, sometimes you have no idea what you are, what you are actually doing, what, what such type you have in your hand. <laughs> so you have to use something. There's no other possibility. Just, just for, for two, it's combined time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so so is this a combined time? Yes, I, I, I understand. Okay, so there is no, there are all that combined. So there yeah, but uh, uh, will I be reported what order expanded to during uh, compiled time? It could be resolved to anything. I, I, I don't know that, and I will. Okay, I understand what. Okay, I, I understand what. Can we talk about it later on? I understand what. It's the same thing we get with template instantiation because that will take this and do it. So if you like single errors, you like also. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The quick, quick question you said that all the code you presented actually compiles. Uh, it certainly doesn't compile the uh, Microsoft uh, Visual C++. And I'm talking about GCC for seven. That was. <laughs> and also maybe C climate uh, should also. Be. We should make a break. Thank <laughs> <laughs>